L let's talk a little bit about the FTSE. It has had a great run. It has outperformed. Even on a currency-adjusted basis, it still looks relatively yeah. attractive. Yeah. Does that rally still have legs? Are we going to see the performance we saw last year being replicated this year? I think it still does have legs. I think it's, it's very easy after the start we've had this year to call the top in the market. But, you know, you highlighted AstraZeneca, the biggest stock in the index. Well-received set of results today. Standard Chartered, up nearly 10% now with this sort of reheated bid prospect from a Middle Eastern financial company. Um, you know, you've had Compass today, a good set of numbers. So I think there's a lot of support when you unpick it all. You know, good companies are reporting solid results, even some of the domestics. And we know Christmas was very good for some of the domestics, like Next, yep. like Marks and Spencers. See, I think you've got a very interesting makeup on a market that still trades on 10 and a bit times P, notwithstanding, as we've talked many times, you know, the oil and gas and the mining, which, yep. which pulls that back down a bit. But I think unpicking that, I think the UK still represents really, really good value. Really? So you're not selling anything into the rally that we've seen, Alan? <laughs> I'm not saying I'm not selling anything. We, we've <laughs> selectively sold a few uh, consumer discretionary names, which uh, you know, which we've held. I mean, an example is something like uh, you know, JD Sports, which is up nearly 100% from last October. And, but I think if you if you cast your mind back to the the quasi Quarteng mini budget, that that flop at the end of September, it, you know, in a way that the market hasn't recovered from that. It still thinks we're in that land. You know, 10-year bond yields got to four and a half percent. We're now at sort of 3.2. But I think the market and the participants in it still think you know, the UK is a bit of a basket case and therefore are surprised that it's actually worked as well as it has. But, but when we unpick all the numbers, actually there's some reasons to be very, very optimistic. And then if we move into the second half of this year, then we've obviously got energy prices coming off. Inflation, we think, will be coming off as well in the second half. Uh, consumers will be better off, relatively speaking. And that's aside from the 250 billion savings that are still sitting there in banks. Yep. FTSE versus FTSE 250 tricky one. I mean, my call was at the beginning of the year that FTSE 100 would continue to outperform. And then as we moved into the second half, when the consumer got a bit more confidence behind it, we thought the, the 250 would take off. 250 at the moment is outperforming. I think it's going to be nip and tuck between those two till we get more clarity on inflation and where that's likely to land and obviously ergo where interest rates ultimately end in the UK. But I think Andrew Bailey is doing a really good job in kind of managing those expectations. It's all about expectation management now. It's all about the talking heads. And I think the Bank of England is regaining its confidence after what was a tough time last yeah. year with transitory inflation and missing that whole, that whole move. Hey, Alan, BP is up like 13% in three days. Do you like the stock? Do you sell into the rally? <laughs> BP is a very big position for us still. Um, I, I was of the view that we, we'd be bookending the oil price between $80 and $90 this year. Therefore, the easy money had been made. You know, if you think last year, the oil price actually didn't go anywhere from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, but the shares were up sort of 40%. So we thought, you know, probably the bulk of the money had been made. What I think has surprised the market, I know you were speaking you know, extensively to the CEO of BP yesterday, you know, is the fact that there's been this tweak or pivot back into fossil fuels and away from some of the investment in renewables, which I think the market does generally struggle with in terms of mm -hmm. what are the returns going to be yep. in 10, 15, 20 years' time. And I think that's manifested itself, because if we look at you know, the Exxon, the Chevron, Conoco playbook, it has been much more about a focus on you know, fossil fuels and the share price performance of the US versus the European peers was very marked last year. The Royal Institution was out with its survey today. Ricks, housing, big part of our economy here, basically sees stagnation. Bloomberg Economics is a 10% downdraft uh, in UK house prices this year. Housing stocks made this move early and went down pretty hard. Are they pricing in all the bad news? I think they are pricing in the bad news because actually if you looked at Barrett's yesterday, Bellway today, we've actually seen, you know, site visits in pickup. You know, we've now got a, a five-year mortgage which starts with a three-handle rather than a six-handle. Yep. And that's a big, big move. We've still got unemployment at 3.6%. So I think that unlike, you know, global financial crisis and things like that, when the balance sheets of the house builders were incredibly stretched... And the banks. And the banks. And we have a situation where both, you know, house builders in particular, still giving us money back. The banks, obviously, core equity tier one ratio, can mine massively different to where they were in 2008. So I, I think, actually, 
you know, house prices are still slightly up on the rolling 12 months. Yes, they're coming off. But I do think that if employment stays you know, somewhere south of sort of 4.2%, then I think the house builders are actually pretty well underpinned at these levels. Hey, Alan, um, Guy gave me the opportunity to follow up on BP, and I was like, nah, I'm good. And now I do have a follow up on BP. So I'm sorry that we're bing bonging you around <laughs> like this. Um, we just got the news that Exxon's going to want to get into the trading business. Um, does this worry you for BP? Because that is the moneymaker. I, I, to be honest with you, I don't know enough about it. You're right that BP you know, makes a lot of money, as does Shell, out of trading. It's a very big market, and you know, it's about having the right talent. But it's also about having the right assets in the right place that you can then trade against. And you're obviously being less familiar with Exxon's assets and how they can use those in a trading environment, I'm not quite sure. But it makes a lot of sense for Exxon when they're looking at the sort of P&L that Shell and BP have achieved uh, to go down this route.